Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 16 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That is Gavin. Uh, Gavin, how you doing, buddy? I'm a little afraid to ask. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been a stressful couple of days uh, for anybody not aware. Uh, there's been a lot of wildfires in western South Dakota, which is where I live. And uh, yeah, there's one that as of this morning, uh, I haven't seen too much updated information about it um, in the last like hour or so. Uh, but as of this morning, uh, it had burned around 1900 acres, oh, which is, is a that- lot. Is that a common thing? Like, I know California seems to, like, light itself on fire every year. Like, does that happen in South Dakota? Is this a common thing? Um, sort of. There were some last spring, um, not nearly as big as these, at least. Or maybe it just seems that way because last year my apartment, uh, the apartment that I lived in, you know, uh, for the last academic year, was pretty well, like, into the residential area of town. Whereas my apartment building this academic year is further outside of town where there's more grass. Um, Mm -hmm. But yesterday was just so incredibly windy um, that like it was like over 40 mile per hour sustained winds with like gusts of close to 80 miles an hour. Yeah, it was very, very windy, which obviously makes things a lot worse. Um, I was going to say, how's the air quality? Uh, when I was at school today, it was completely fine. Um, at my apartment, which is, you know, closer to the actual fires, uh, it's definitely smoky outside. You can definitely, like, feel it. But, um, yeah, they've they've told me that, uh, you know, there shouldn't be any more evacuations that have, that will need to happen, at least, at least for me. <laughs> uh, I will not need to evacuate. So... Uh, that's always good, but yeah, over, over like 400 homes. So like, who knows how many actual, like, you know, number of people that is have, have had to be evacuated. So, uh, that's obviously super scary. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, I've seen videos online of like, you know, people that have needed to escape wildfires and like people that have been warned probably too late Mm -hmm. and trying to get out from it. Like it's, that stuff's no joke. So I, you know, I, I hope you're okay, buddy. That is, uh, that's a scary situation. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yesterday was was a very nerve wracking day because <laughs> because it, it started. Um, I think it started sometime overnight. Like so, fourth wall. We're recording this on Tuesday, um, so they think that it started sometime like either very early in the morning on Monday or late Sunday. And it started on somebody's private property, uh, and they haven't announced too much about the cause, but they have said that it was like human caused. Like it wasn't like a lightning strike or something. Um, that doesn't like imply any like intentionality, like not arson or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, at least not that they have publicly said so far. Um, but yeah, it was, it it has been significantly less windy today than it was yesterday. And, uh, that's going to sort of continue through the rest of the week, but, uh, we're not expected to get any rain at least for the next seven days, probably more. So, oh goodness. Yeah. Well, stay safe because that's you know I, I'm glad that things seem like they've died down so far today, but still, you know I imagine those situations could change, you know overnight if uh, if things went the wrong way. So uh, definitely, definitely stay safe, and uh, you know we'll all be you know we'll all be rooting for you. Oh, thanks. Uh, let's uh, let's lighten the mood a little bit here. I don't know if you have your uh, your calendar out, but let's talk about what's gone on kind of this week in history. This is going to come out on last day of March. So what yeah. uh, are we? Is this going to be a March or an April? It is. It is March. Did, okay. Can Can you guess a year for me? Oh boy! So they're all like they're all more recent than I ever would have guessed. Like I, you know, if I had no idea, I'd be guessing like 1973 or something. <laughs> but like, I don't, these are all like incredibly recent. So I'm going to say 2018. Close 2019. And I th- I think this calendar oh, specifically. I mean, obviously, lots of cool stuff has happened throughout like science history, but I think I think they try to focus on more recent stuff. I guess that's good. Like, there's you know you know it's good that there is you know some focus on things that have happened more re- like there's still cool stuff being done. Yeah, exactly. So I'll take that. All right, what do we got? Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on 
how you look at it. Uh, it's another dinosaur one. <laughs> so yes, from okay. March 29th, 2019, mm-hmm. the headline is Fossil Deathbed Linked to Dinosaur Killing Meteor. Okay, I have a, I have a question. Go ahead. So, I, I don't know if you can anticipate this one, but Fossil Deathbed, like... I assumed most fossils were just kind of presumed to be deathbeds. Otherwise, I think what they mean is a bone bed, which is okay. like a specific term for just like an entire like layer being very rich in bones, usually caused by a lot of things dying at the same time. Typically, it can be from things like a flood. Um, or I guess in this case, uh, you know, that, that big old meteor. Um, <laughs> but I guess we'll have to read and see. Okay. So please do paleontologists from the university of California, Berkeley announced that, uh, the discovery of a 66 million year old deathbed that they say is linked to the meteor that is believed to have killed the dinosaurs. But if this is me talking now, as we know, it is more complicated than that. Um, Trademark, it's more complicated than that. Yes. Uh, The site, which is located in the Hell Creek Formation near Bowman, North Dakota, consists of layer upon layer of fossilized fish, mammals, insects, glass beads known as tektites, and even a partial set of triceratops remains. Researchers say that this discovery marks the first of its kind, representing the only mass deathbed linked to the impact that wiped out 75% of all life on Earth. Described as a, quote, natural museum, unquote, researchers hope that the deathbed will provide unprecedented insight into the late Cretaceous period for decades to come. Hmm. So, yes, they okay. do mean they do mean bone bed there. Um, more often than not, though, when I've heard bone bed used, it's typically referring to a bunch of specimens of the same species. I don't think that it has to be. Um, whenever I've heard bone bend use, it's been something completely different, but I guess, you know, <laughs> things can have, you know, multiple meanings. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that they found tectites though, um, without really mentioning what those are. Yeah. What is the tectite? So that is, it's a term that I like I've heard, but not incredibly familiar with. So let's do a quick Google. Let's do it. I love, I know whenever people are doing this, they always make the joke like, oh, this is great radio. But like, I always really enjoy hearing like the clickety clack on people's keyboards as they're searching for stuff live on a podcast. Well, yeah, I mean, th- I mean, isn't this what a normal person would do? I don't know. Absolutely. So uh, tectites are rounded, pitted bodies of silicate glass, non-volcanic in origin, um, most likely derived from large hypervelocity meteorite collisions with terrestrial rocks. So. Essentially, it's uh, so for anybody who doesn't know, which is probably most people, uh, the element silicon is the most common element, at least in the Earth's like crust, the outside of the Earth. Um, And that is because the most common minerals, such as your quartzes, your feldspires, uh, have a lot of silicon in them. Uh, And so those that have a lot of uh, silicate which is silicon dioxide, so one silicon atom, two oxygen atoms. Um, Those are referred to as silicate minerals. And so they're very, very, very common. So that's not all that surprising, Um, but it specifies that they are non-volcanic in origin. So it is not like it came out of a volcano, which is where you typically find natural glass from, things like obsidian, which is natural glass. Um, But yeah, so that's, I don't think... We have um, another like good hypothesis for how tectites form, other than from things like meteor strikes. Um, although That's I will I will wild. say that it that it is possible to create glass um, from lightning. Um, and this, anybody who's seen the movie The Notebook uh, should should know that uh, if lightning strikes like a beach. Uh, it will basically melt that sand and turn into glass. Um, But to get them forming in sort of this specific 
structure. Uh, I don't think we have another good hypothesis for how they form other than meteor strikes. That's wild to me that just like, I assume meteor strikes don't happen all the time. And yet like, you'd be surprised. Really? Yeah. Like, I mean, big ones. Yeah. Those don't come around all that often. Um, But I would say like double digits per year. I'd say really. And like how big, like are these ones that, like they almost I'd say like up before they... maybe like somewhere between golf ball, baseball size. Okay. So I'm assuming these are things that just don't like make it to the earth's surface. Oh no. That's by the time they get to the surface. Oh wow. Uh, well, see and this, this, okay. To be fair, this is me not actually knowing. I just know that it is far more common than people think. That So the, these are numbers that I'm like, sort of, th- this is a very rough guesstimate, but, um, it would not at all surprise me if it was in in the dozens per year. That wow! I am trying to do a quick Google search, and this is not my area of expertise, so I'm trying to do what I can. Here. <laughs> but, anyways, we can. Uh, as I uh, completely failed to look this up, sorry, everybody. Uh, we can <laughs> uh, we can go ahead and get to today's actual topic. Now, I know this week, uh, for as we discussed in the beginning, this has been kind of a, a stressful week for you, so this might be. A little bit of a shorter episode than uh, than normal because you've had some other things on your mind. Um, but uh, what uh, you know, what is it that we're going to be actually discussing today? So we're going to be talking about one of my favorite events in Earth history, at least recent Earth history, uh, which is called the Great American Biotic Interchange, or GABI for short. And Gabby. we we have sort of hinted to it in the second part of our six hundred million years in. 60 slash 120 minutes. Um, so it is an event that happened uh, about two and a half million years ago when North America and South America sort of collided, you know, because they were separate for millions and millions of years before this. Uh, so it's a really, really neat event in Earth's history. It's one that I actually did a presentation on just for, for a class uh, two semesters ago. Um, and then also... If you remember, I have a blog and I've just recently put up a blog post all about this. So any information that you might have questions about, I definitely head over there to deepdigs.net and uh, check yeah, out. Once again, what was the name of your website? Deepdigs.net. That would be deepdigs.net. <laughs> that would be right. Deepdigs.net, everybody. Yeah. So it all sort of started around 30-ish million years ago when South America became completely isolated uh, for like hundreds of millions of years, it had always been with other continents. For example, um, most people know of the supercontinent Pangaea. Pretty much everybody has at least heard of it. Um, but there was a supercontinent before that uh, around, it also from, from the first part of these 600 million years in 60 slash 120 minutes. Um, you'll know that around 600-ish million years ago, there was another supercontinent. Around that time, a lot of the continents that are in the Southern Hemisphere, so that'd be South America, Africa, uh, what was in, India was at the time in, in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, Australia, and I don't remember if I said Antarctica or not yet, but um, yeah, so the four Southern continents, as well as India, were part of a not super super continent but uh sort of like like a super group it it would be like the beatles but then pangea would be like if the beatles had like an album with the rolling stones or something um so that that's not so super continent was called gondwana gondwana was together for basically uh you know, over 500 million years. Crazy how long Gondwana stuck together. But then after Pangaea broke up, um, you know, North America broke off, Europe and Asia broke off. Uh, and then slowly, the, the continents that formed Gondwana sort of started to break off one by one. You know, first India left, then Africa, and then eventually at about 30 million years ago or so, South America was completely isolated by itself. Yeah, any questions so far, Mike? How are you doing? 
I think so. I just want to make sure that I have the my continents listed. So when we're talking about Gondwana. Can you just run through what continents you know, or what we would recognize today as being part of Gondwana? Because I would just want to make sure that I'm following this correctly. Yeah, absolutely. It was all the continents that are today in the southern hemisphere. So that would be your South America, Africa, Australia, and Antarctica. And as then well as all, India, right? As well as India and also uh, Arabia, you know, what today is mostly made up by the country of Saudi Arabia. Um, mm-hmm. So those continents and subcontinents uh, were combined into Gondwana. And then and this is after Pangaea, correct? This was before and after. Before. Oh, okay. So this is, that's, it that's leads how, into and comes out of Pangaea. Yes. Okay. It is basically Gondwana moves north to hit the other not so super continent in the north that was composed of North America and Eurasia called uh, L- Laurasia. I don't know why we name things so similarly, but um, yeah, the northern smallish super continent was called Laurasia and the southern one was called Gondwana. Okay. They collided, um, you know, roughly, you know, I'd, I'd say like 300 ish. That, that might be a little old, but somewhere around there, a million years ago to form Pangaea. And then by around 180 million years ago, it was starting to break apart. Um, Gondwana sort of broke off bit by bit. It didn't all sort of break apart at once. Um, but then 33-ish million years ago at the sort of in the Oligocene epoch, if you're remembering some of your uh, sort of geologic time breakups from the uh 600 million years in i'm just gonna say 120 minutes at this point um, <laughs> but yeah so that was around 33 million years ago is when south america fully became isolated now when we think of south america being isolated like i don't you know teddy roosevelt made this a slightly more difficult thing but like i don't think of south america <laughs> today as being completely isolated like it is it is connected to north america kind of through panama so is it you know you know again absent the panama canal that we have today was were north america and south america i assume they weren't always touching each other and is that the is that true at this time that is absolutely true and they didn't you know from the time that pangaea broke up about 180 ish million years ago until about two and a half million years ago so they spent wow over 160 plus million years apart. Um, and then just in the last, like I said, like two, two and a half million years, did they actually start to join through, through it's actually called the Isthmus of Panama. Um, hmm. That little tiny land bridge that forms between North and South America. Wonderful. And so I assume we're going to be talking about that period of time where South America is kind of single and doing its own thing. Absolutely. We are because it got weird all right how weird let's talk so most people might be sort of familiar with some things like um like like the galapagos islands and how the galapagos islands even if you know almost nothing else about them you know that they have really unique animals they have things like marine iguanas don't exist anywhere else nothing even close to them exists anywhere else lots of different you know unique bird species they had the galapagos tortoise you know the largest species of tur- uh, well at least tortoise in the world not quite turtle in the world um but things tend to get weird when they have like a genetic bottleneck because they're on an island um so things either generally go extinct when they get bottlenecked like that or they get super super weird Is the reason for that being that they like they need to adapt to a really specific, you know, uh, environment and either they can't and die out or they do. And just that that evolutionary, uh, you know, however you want, whatever you want to term it. But that Mm -hmm. series of evolution just winds up like we don't need any of the things we would normally you know, associate with living not on a very specific island. And so we're going to get weird with it. You know, we're going to develop all these different, you know, characteristics. Yeah, that is, that is pretty broadly true. Okay. Um, But the thing with how we know islands today, where things like the Galapagos, if you went there, you would at least, you know, every animal there 
you would at least be able to point at it and be like, okay, you are a lizard. You are a tortoise. You would be familiar with its larger level taxonomy, you know, the different names we give to things. Um, whereas South America was isolated so early in sort of mammalian evolution, um, you know, because mammals, mammals had been around since like the early Jurassic period around that 180 ish million years ago. But they didn't start to like really take off until the dinosaurs went extinct uh, about 66 million years ago. So for half of that time, South America was just kind of cruising by itself. Um, and so a lot of like the super weird things that like most people would, would look at it and be like, I, I know you're a mammal, but what are you? Like even a lot of paleontologists, like if, if I saw a skeleton of most of these animals, I would not know what it was. Can I ask you a quick question that's just kind of related to what you were talking about a second ago? Yeah, of course. And so Galapagos, that rings a bell to me, and I think most mm -hmm. people, because that was where Charles Darwin went to do a lot of his groundbreaking research, correct? Among many other places, but yeah. Okay. Did he choose the Galapagos for this reason? Like, did he know what he was doing, or was that sort of uh, you know a stroke of luck? To my, to my knowledge, no. No to which part of that? Um, I, I think that they sort of stumbled upon it. That, and again, this okay. is me. I, I don't know this. Okay. Yeah, this I, was, is, this I wasn't is sure. If, yeah. Estimating. Okay. Um, just because when he was doing a lot of his work, especially like the Pacific side of South America, Central America was not all that explored. You know, the Atlantic side was because that's, you know, where the European colonizers came from. Um, but the Pacific side, not so much, which is, which is where the Galapagos Islands are. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right, so back to South America. So South America mm -hmm. becomes isolated so early on that it's not like, you know, we start with lizards and, you know, they're evolving oddly, but we can still identify them as lizards somewhere. This is so early on that we don't even know what we're dealing with. Do I have that right? Not with lizards. Lizards specifically evolved quite early. Um and diversified quite early. Okay. Uh, this is mostly mammals. Obviously, there were okay. lots of weird everything, but pretty much any reptile, with, with a couple of exception, exceptions that I will talk about, um, you'd be able to look at that and be like, I, I know what that is, broadly. Um, but the mammals, ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. So, like, and, and for example, you know, we generally know where most orders of mammals fall so orders would be things like uh the order rodentia for rodents uh primates is an order um lar large groups of mammals we mostly know where those fall in relation to one another so it's like we know that uh the rodent order is closely related to the uh lag to the order lagomorpha which is rabbits and hares because they are not rodents uh but they are closely related and then that little group that they make is closely related to primates and so on and so forth until we have like a, a you know, tree of how they're all related to one another. Mm -hmm. A lot of these orders that we see in South America, uh, we didn't really know where they fit until relatively recently. And even some of them were still like, does it actually fall there? I don't know. <laughs> and so a lot of these groups don't have any members anymore they're other than just how weird they are they're not really worth mentioning just because most people won't know <laughs> what i'm talking <laughs> about because i frankly don't like i said if i saw a skeleton of one of these i wouldn't know what it was and, and i'd be able to you? i'd be able to tell them like okay it's a mammal you know how so let, let me actually ask you that how would you be able to tell that it's a mammal like what what characteristics can you tell just from the skeleton that would say oh yeah this this is a mammal and i have nothing further beyond that I mean, by far the easiest thing would be a skull because with very, very few exceptions, mammals are the only vertebrates who have specialized teeth. You know, hmm. in, in your mouth, you have your flat incisors, your kind of pointy canines, your sort of pointy, sort of flat premolars, and then your flat premolars. Mm -hmm. um, reptiles don't have that. Fish don't have that. Uh, all of their teeth are different sizes, but they're all the same shape. 
Okay. Um, that would be the easiest thing. Also, mammals have a lot fewer bones in our skull than any other vertebrates do. Um, mammals are the only vertebrates to have, uh, you know, vertebrae between their their neck and their pelvis that don't have ribs. So, like, you have your vertebrae that have your ribs, and then you have your vertebrae that are lower down that do not have ribs on them. Uh, reptiles don't have that. Pretty much every vertebra in a reptile has ribs. Um, so there are lots of ways to tell that it's a mammal. Gotcha. Okay. But yeah, like there are some that's one of them in particular that I put in, in the blog post kind of looks like Alf, like the puppet alien from whenever that TV show was from. Al, this is ALF? ALF. Yes. Alf. Okay. I'm going to look it, this up. It kind of looks like Alf, but with some sharp pointy teeth. Um, oh goodness. Wow. Yeah. And so again, if you saw that, you'd be like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> I can confirm. I don't know what this is. Um, again, in, in the show, Alf is an alien, but like there's, there's a group of animals called, uh, astrapathiers, which I had never heard of before, you know, doing the research for that presentation and, and for this blog post because they never made it off South America. They were around uh, during the Eocene into the Oligocene a little bit. Um, so roughly between like 40 and 30-ish million years ago. And then they go extinct. Um, and that, that was even sort of before South America was even isolated. That things were getting real weird. Um, really? But thing, things get really interesting in South America once it becomes isolated because it is one of the few places that still had parts of its ecosystem like dominated by reptiles because after the dinosaurs go extinct um you know like right after dinosaurs go extinct birds sort of become some of the top predators in a lot of ecosystems like really really large birds um but then once mammals start taking over that generally is the case for for you know i'd, I'd say like 55 to 50 million million years ago until now Pretty much every ecosystem is, at least terrestrial ecosystem, is dominated by mammals. Right. Except in South America. <laughs> because. They're the exception. They kept those giant birds and made them bigger. <laughs> <laughs> there are giant, like, 10 foot tall, flightless, predatory birds that would literally, like, th they were, like, the largest predator around. By a lot. Uh, there were these weird marsupial cousins. They're, they're not quite marsupials as we know them, but they're somewhat closely related, um, called sporacidonts. That a lot of people sort of draw, try to draw comparisons between them and some predators that we have today. Um, so there's a type of sporacidont called thylacosmilus because it has uh, like saber teeth. And like the name of the saber tooth cat is Smilodon. So they sort of name it after other things to try and be like, okay, I guess this is what this sort of looks like. But yeah, it's, it had these big saber teeth. Um, super, super weird. There were some predatory opossums, which just sounds horrifying to me. Predatory opossums. Now, correct me if I'm like opossums. I keep seeing like people who don't know what they're talking about sharing memes on Facebook. Yep. That are like, hey, opossums are actually cool. They are cool. Like, I love them. Right. Yeah, that's what, like, and, and I believe you've talked about them on the podcast. Before. I absolutely have. <laughs> so, uh, predatory opossum, like ones I would have to be afraid of. Oh yeah, they'd be like medium-ish dog-sized. <laughs> that and, like, and predatory, yeah. I would love to see one. Like, I don't want to be anywhere near one of these things, but I do want to see one. Oh yeah, and so like there, there definitely were some mammal predators around, especially on sort of like the in the plains of south america which there weren't all that many of and still today kind of aren't that many of um but in like the rainforest area oh it was it was all reptiles um there's a type of snake that you might have heard of just because it's got a cool name uh called titanoboa i believe you've mentioned this as well on this i phone. i believe i have too um mm -hmm. like 40 plus foot long constricting snake I don't think many people would argue that that wasn't like one of the top predators in its environment. I certainly wouldn't. 
uh, 30 plus foot long crocodilians. Man, this is some Florida stuff right here. Oh, this is like advanced Florida. <laughs> and like, you you don't ever want to go, you do not ever want to go advanced Florida. But South America did. Um, and so there was also some really crazy terrestrial running adapted crocodilians. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Uh, go and on. Instead of being sort of the, the flat boys that we know and love today, they the went from... snappy boys. Yes, they went from having their legs kind of out to the side to yeah. underneath them, similar to how mammals do. And they were terrestrial, not, you know, your, you know, ambush hunters like you see with like, you know, saltwater crocodiles, Nile crocodiles. They were running adapted active chasing predators okay i've had this question with a lot of the stuff that we've and like i i'm assuming that i'm preempting this and you're going to get there just we have to wait but how the hell did that thing ever go extinct so a lot of things weirdly and we, we will sort of circle back to this but a lot of the predators that i'm talking about here you know like the running crocodiles some of the giant crocodiles or some are still around um and the giant snakes were extinct before North America got there. What the, that, so, I have more questions now, but okay. And I, and I will say, there is a lot we don't know about South American paleontology just because, A, um, the, a lot of countries south, in South America tend to be some of the poorer countries, so they don't have a lot of the, the money to fund research. Um, also, it's... A lot, a lot of forest, you know, at least supposed to be. Brazil needs to not knock it off and stop cutting down the Amazon. But um, mm -hmm. forests don't tend to preserve fossils very well. Really? Just because there's nothing really being deposited. There's no sediment being deposited, which you need sediment to cover bodies of things in order to preserve them well. Um, yeah, so, so like, for sense. example, Titanoboa. We don't even have close to a full skeleton of that. We have a couple vertebrae, I think. But with, with snakes, it's like they're all vertebrae. So it's like most things that are diagnostic about a snake. So it's like we can tell that it's a giant boid, you know, in the boa family. Mm -hmm. um, and so the like 40 plus foot estimate purely comes from just how large these vertebra are. So big asterisk next to Titanobo. But um right. So there's just a lot of environments that aren't very conducive to preserving fossils and also, in general, a lack of the historic research that has happened in, like, North America and Europe. Um, and the exact same can, thing can also be said about Africa as well, um, where it's just been historically people from the northern continents coming there and taking their fossils. So instead of investing in you know, places that are local that can support paleontology as they should, you know. Um, and I fully plan on doing an entire episode about that topic in the future. But uh, for now, we'll, we'll just sort of move on. So I will say there's a lot we don't know about South America. So for all we know, some of these things could have been around at the time. Uh, but there's just so many questions that it's kind of hard to answer why things like these running adapted crocodilians went extinct do we know that they're not still alive now yes okay yes we do <laughs> that's so, just you know man no. if we're gonna have i have a bone to pick with charles darwin at this point uh, okay like who is okay i, I it, like like fully understanding that there's that I, I am completely just flying by the seat of my pants here without any actual information but it seems like one of those things like 30 foot long crocodile adapted to run on land. Like that thing seems so, like so it's the, a the, the giant, animal. The giant ones were not running adapted. Oh, okay. I mean, even still, what? Okay. That's... No, the, the, the giant, giant ones were still like the big live in the water ambush predator type ones. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. But the, the running adapted ones would be probably not significantly smaller than like a Nile crocodile or a saltwater crocodile, probably shorter because they don't need their tail uh, as, as much. 
But oh, okay. So this is all right. This is a little bit different than the image I had in my head. Okay. Yeah. Um. But anyway, well, what is your bone to pick with Charles Darwin? I, I cut it you was, off there. It, I mean, the bone to pick with Charles Darwin was just like the. It was a, uh, a more a comment on evolution. Like, how can a thirty foot long running, you know, ground adapted crocodile go extinct? However, I am being told that that animal never ever existed, <laughs> which is good because none of us would exist if uh, if that thing was ever around. I mean, humans are traditionally very good at killing large animals. So, <laughs> um, you know what? Fair enough. But yeah. Anyway, circling back. So. Yeah, South America was real weird with its predators because they were mostly reptiles. Like I said, some mammalian ones, but mostly reptiles, including birds, um, were, were sort of the, I, I don't like using this term, but like the apex predator in, in their ecosystems. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we get to what they were eating, <laughs> which is also crazy because, so a lot of just the, in general, weird animals that are still around. Like, if you ask, like, a mammologist, like, what's one of the weirder mammals, they'll be, like, sloths. I, sloths are weird. And, like, they're right. I guess I see mine. Sloths like, are I mean, weird. It's almost um, like the opposite of what I was saying before. Like, how are sloths, how, like, how are sloths able to keep existing, considering they are so incredibly slow? I know very little about sloths, but yeah. So, there's actually uh, a hypothesis and I don't, I don't know how much I believe it, but this is just one that's been kind of tossed around mostly as a joke, but it makes a little bit of sense that like sloths still exist because they're so nutritionally poor that nothing bothers to eat them. <laughs> okay. Like I, I know for, for example, harpy eagles, which are a very, very large species of eagle that lives in central and South American forests. Uh, they will purposefully avoid eating sloths so that the younger ones who can't don't know how to hunt as well will eat them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that kind of just goes to show things about sloths. But guess where sloths evolved? South America. South America. Wow. And the sloths that we have today are actually the weird ones for sloths. Um, and this might just be another artifact of be- sloths lived in forests. Forests do not leave good fossils. We have almost no good tree sloth fossils. We have excellent ground sloth fossils. So the sloths that we have today are the weird ones. They are not the normal sloth. So say say that one more time. The sloths we have today are which kinds? Tree sloths. Tree sloths, and they are not the ones. So there were sloths that were on the ground. There were many sloths that were on the ground. Okay. In- including ones that were like elephant sized. What? Yep. Man, you weren't kidding. South America is wild. And so they they are not sloths in the way that you think of them. So they are not these and really I... dopey looking animals, at least the big ground sloths, because they essentially just got so big so they could just kind of sit and grab branches and bring them to itself mm-hmm. without having to move a whole lot. The same reason that like sauropod dinosaurs, the ones with the the really big ones with the long necks, have such long necks. So they can reach a lot of food without really having to expend all that much energy. Um, but they just got so big that basically like elephants, nothing really bothered them. Right. So yeah, there were elephant or bigger, you know, not much bigger, but around like Indian elephant sized sloths, just sort of roaming around South America. <laughs> Um, and then th- those are incredibly well known and we will circle back to them later. A group of sloths that I actually don't know all that much about. They were actually marine sloths. Mer- wait, wow. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so I- there were sloths that were swimming and like seaweed eating, we think, uh, adapted. So, like I said, like the tree sloths today seem like normal and like the ground sloths and the swimming ones were the weird ones. But like, just based on the number of species that we know of, n- no, the tree sloths were the were the weird ones. Like, yeah, the sloths are is so incredibly weird. <laughs> we did have a separate episode all on sloths at one point. I would love that. Um, so sloths are members of a group called Xenarthra, which means 
weird or or foreign joint um because everything about them is super weird and that but they are not the only xenarthrians so the order xenarthra uh did evolve in south america other members are things like anteaters um armadillos and armadillos so anteaters don't have a great history so i'm not going to talk about them all that much we just don't have great fossils of them Mm -hmm. um but armadillos also were real weird. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to bring in the movie ice age, which hopefully many people have seen. I quite like it, that movie. It, it's been a little while, but, uh, I, I remember enjoying those movies quite thoroughly as a youth. So Sid is a ground sloth. Mm-hmm. If you saw any, you know, large shelled animals, that sort of look like a turtle, but not. Where they have a much like domier shell than a turtle. Those are very closely related to armadillos. They are called glyptodonts. They uh, were roughly the size of a car. With that whole shell just made out of bone. Very similar to a turtle. Wow. Uh, different in that. It wasn't really connected to most of their skeleton, whereas a turtle shell is, you know, a shell is made out of its ribs, basically. Uh, mm-hmm. Glyptodont shells are not. They're b- a bone that is purely, like, in the skin. Um, but, yeah, they got to be, like, the size of a car, some of the larger ones. And, again, just kicking around, South America, nothing really to worry about because it, it was it's really weird to me just from an evolution standpoint that some of these animals got so large because there were not that many predators. You would think getting big is like a defense mechanism, right? Right. You get so big that the things that would eat you don't scare you anymore. But mm-hmm. I don't know. Some There just weren't a lot of predators. Um, and mm-hmm. some people also sort of propose that like some of the tall uh, flightless birds they have massive, massive beaks, like very, very chunky in order to like peck and bash through the shells of these glyptodonts and kill them that way. Wow. That's it's hardcore. I, right. <laughs> Man, South America. Everything in awesome. South America is so weird. Um, now, can I ask you this question? Is, yeah. So obviously this is, you know, going back millions of years. Is there anything in South America today that, like there are traces of this or the biology of South America in, you know, the Amazon or, you know, anywhere else is still, still kind of shows us, you know, how weird it can be, or has that been largely, uh, you know, that, that is no longer the case. Sort of. And we will circle around to the reason why. Okay. Um, but there's one more group that I want to talk about and I could go on and on about just the weird things, gr- groups that we don't have anymore that lived in South America, but there's one more that I want to talk about. And they're called the noto ungulates. So an, an ungulate is a hooved animal. Think of, you know, horses, rhinos, deer, giraffes, uh, things like that. And noto okay. is a prefix that means Southern. So Southern ungulates. Um, we think that they are sort of a sister group to perissodactyls, which is the group that today includes horses, rhinos, and tapers. Okay. And so, but we don't actually know. That's like our best guess. We don't, they're, they're so weird that we, we kind of don't know. So basically, this one group filled basically every like niche of herbivores that are like rhino size and smaller. Mm-hmm. So, we had ones, like I said, rhino sized. We had ones that look like shockingly like rabbits for some reason. <laughs> They're like, oh, I guess, there's no rabbits here. I guess I'll do a rabbit thing, even though I'm an ungulate and have hooves. Sure. Uh, and literally <laughs> everything in between. Um, incredibly, incredibly weird. Uh, we even have some that like have some kind of evidence of like a horn similar to like a rhino, not as large uh, as what most people would think of with, with a rhino. Uh, We have some that we think, and again, all this is speculative just because we haven't studied them 
incredibly closely, but there are some that we think did similar things to like hippos where they kind of lived amphibiously and lived a lot in, in the water spent a lot of their time in the water. Um, incredibly, incredibly weird group. And they're one group that I really wish was still alive because they're so like diverse and really weird. Is there again, a number of questions that are just thrown up, but like, is there that whole idea of a group of, is there one period of time that you would love to like be alive in just to study the certain kinds of animals that were alive at that time? For me, I think it would probably be the late Paleocene and early Eocene. So roughly 50 ish million years ago, just because there were a lot of really janky, weird mammals at the time. And that fits into, doesn't that fit into the, the timeline we have here for single uh, South America? A little bit. I mean, at that point, South America was still connected to, I don't think it was still connected to Africa, but it was definitely still connected to uh, Antarctica and, and Australia. Okay. Um, where, but, would, where would you be studying at that point? Probably North America, just because. Okay, this the, still your the, jam. This, the, well, yeah, just because that's what I'm most familiar with, and that's where I know most of the janky, weird stuff is from. <laughs> okay. Um, but, so we've talked at length about what was going on in South America at this time. So let's sort of talk briefly about what's going on in North America at the time. And it's pretty much like today. Uh, with a couple exceptions, you know, we had um, proboscideans, you know, elephant-like things. Not quite elephants, but related. Mm-hmm. Um is North America on its own as well, or is North America still connected to like Europe? Like, what what's North America doing in terms of we will get we will get to that. Oh boy, okay. Um, so yeah, in North America, it was a lot like today, except that we still had proboscideans, we had uh, camels, we had horses that were actually native, not brought over by Europeans, um, and we had tapers still. Um, I don't think we still had rhinos. I think they had gone extinct in North America by this time. Um, But by and large, it was very similar to today. And the reason for that was because we kept getting things exchanged from Eurasia throughout throughout most of, you Mm -hmm. know, so so, like I said, this, this event happened about two and a half million years ago for probably the 20 million years before that it was very frequent that we would get, you know, exchange new things with Asia. Mm -hmm. Very, very frequent. That's where these proboscideans came from. That is where, um, I think horses came originally from Eurasia, I think, but then it greatly diversified in North America. Um, I think, you know, lots and lots of, you know, predators, lots and lots of, uh, you know, hooved animals, herbivores, lots and lots of interchange. And we will circle again back to that. There's a lot of circling in this episode. <laughs> it's, it's, there, it's, yeah. it's, it's a little arm wavy, but that's okay. Um, so that's basically what North America looked like. Pretty much today with a couple extra things. Sure. Then, uh, but there, well, we should also talk about what wasn't there as well. The two notable groups that are pretty present historically in North America, uh, but we're not at the time. Uh, so one is deer. Deer had not yet come over um, or had just come over at the time that this happened. Uh, and bovids, so that would be your cattle, your goats, and your sheep, they had not come over yet. So that would be things like your bison, your mountain goats. Um, they had not yet come over from Asia yet. So... Right before, as as North America and South America were moving slightly, slightly closer to each other, there, there were islands that sort of popped up here and there between the two. And those islands allowed some island hopping of various groups from one continent to the other before, mm-hmm. the, before they actually full force, you know, smacked into each other. So right. we have evidence of one of those giant birds in Texas and Florida around 5 million years ago. So over 2 million years before the full force exchange, um, Mm -hmm. raccoons sort of made the journey from North America to South America the same way. And interestingly, uh, they, some of them got 
ra- rather large too, because they were like, well, there's no, uh, there's no predators here. I guess I'm going to get big and I'm going to be the predator. <laughs> so there were also relatively large predatory raccoons at the time. Uh, and then also, okay. yeah, yeah. Right. Again, like even, I, should, I, I guess at this point I shouldn't be surprised we're, you know, 40, however many minutes into this, ep- <laughs> you know, fi- almost 50 minutes into uh, this episode, but man, you weren't kidding. Yep. You delivered with this South America is weird nonsense. It's so weird. Um, Where did you like, is this a course you take? Is this just something that like every biologist, like, how, or, nope, how this, is, is, this is just or, a hobby. Okay. I just really enjoy South American paleontology. It's super wow. cool. Um, and then, you know, we have also have evidence of different kinds of rodents because South America did, did have rodents, but they were different kind of rodents than we had in North America. Um, right. So we see some evidence of North American rodents uh, before the, the full force collision and also skunks as well. Um, mm-hmm. And then besides those giant birds, we also have some evidence of things like some of the giant sloths being in North America uh, pre-collision. So it wasn't like it all happened at once. And obviously there were probably lots of birds that flew back and forth uh, just because, you know, birds. Um, mm-hmm. But birds don't fossilize all that well. So that's also kind of arm wavy. But so now we get to what actually happened. And at first when they hit each other, the exchange of like North American species moving to South America and South American species moving north was roughly equal at the beginning. Uh, but then almost immediately, the North American species just started dunking on the South American species. And just to clarify real quick, when you say they hit each other, you mean North and South America yes. make contact. And is it, do we know that it's the same spot that it kind of is now where, you know, Panama yeah. connects with Colombia? Okay. Yep. Um, but yeah, yeah. So when, once, once, the isthmus of Panama formed. Uh, again, relatively equal exchange at the start, but pretty soon after that, uh, it was very clear that the North American species were just dunking like hard. Now, how is that possible, considering what we know about how just crazy the South American it, does this fall into that same category of we just don't know? Like, why is it that the North American species were so dominant? So there are two hypotheses. One. Well, actually, there were many hypotheses, but there's a couple that we're going to cover here. One is that because of the constant exchange with Eurasia and and therefore Africa, you know, because Africa, Europe and Asia are all very interconnected, even today. Um, Mm -hmm. And then so once they started exchanging stuff with North America, too, um, that just gave species on all four of those continents a lot more things to compete against. And therefore made them better competitors. It, this is this is a vast oversimplification, but it's essentially it like in a sport, if you play against better players, you will get better. Uh, I, that actually makes some amount of sense. And so, do you mind if I just restate that? Just to absolutely make sure I understand. So, because North America was also connected to Eurasia. Mm-hmm. There was just a lot more competition going on. And so whatever animals, you know, if we're again taking Darwin's idea here, uh, you know, whatever animals were left at that point, you know, had been selected for, mm-hmm. you know, for being for being able to compete, for being able to be better predators. And so South America, even though they were really, really cool, it's sort of like, you know, just playing, you know, your local travel ball. <laughs> you might be really, you might be really good there until you know you go play a national tournament and realize that you're not quite as good as you thought you were. That is again that this is a very large oversimplification, but that is basically how it works. Gotcha. Um, and so everyone knows the phrase "survival of the fittest," and most people incorrectly believe that that is how evolution works because they misunderstand what the word "fitness" means. In evolution, fitness basically just means how if, how efficiently you are able to reproduce. It doesn't right. mean anything about how muscular you are. It doesn't mean anything about, you know, how fast you can run, how, you know, physically strong you are, or even like how smart you are. It's just, are you real good at making lots of babies? Cool. You're pretty fit. Um, I remember shortly before I dropped out of a uh, an anthropo- or no, um, 
certainly not answer. Uh, I forget what the course <laughs> was when I was in college, but shortly before I dropped out of that, because it was far too hard. I remember learning that sexual selection was way mm-hmm. more important than natural, natural selection, which makes sense. Like, as long as you can, you know, get to the point where, you know, you are making babies, you, know, you are going to, you are going to last for quite a while. That varies from, from group to group, but I, I would argue that, that that's definitely an, an opinion that is becoming more popular Okay. in, in recent years. Um, again, that varies very broadly from, from species to species, but I'd say that's broadly true. Um, but yeah, just because these North American species and even a lot of the new ones like the deer, uh, that had just got to North America, um, were, had just way more things to compete against when, when they finally were competing against the South American species, uh, the North American and, you know, Eurasian and African species were just way better at, you know, more efficient at reproducing than the South American species were and drove them to extinction. That is classically how people interpret this. That is falling less and less out of favor just because we don't, most people sort of believe, or it is becoming more commonly believed that competition is more of a stressor and less of something that by itself will cause things to go extinct. Mm -hmm. So it is, you know, like, like we've talked about with mass extinctions, it is never that simple. It is never just one thing that causes something to go extinct, whether it's a giant meteor, whether it's uh, a new, basically invasive species. It is never that simple that is just one thing. Um, but that, that for a very long time was the prevailing theory. But then as we be, began to find more and more fossils and getting better times on some of these fossils, we realized that a lot of the things that people had traditionally thought that the North American species had driven to extinction actually went extinct a decent bit of time before North America and South America collided. Uh, things like those sporacidonts, the like marsupial cousins that were predatory, Most people thought that, you know, like the uh, saber-toothed cats coming from North America into South America uh, outcompeted them and drove them to extinction. But that's not really true because now we know that they went extinct at least one to two million, if not a little more, million years before the collision. So they had nothing to do with each other then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, So what is more plausible is... That plus, so the whole competition thing, plus the just geography and landscapes, because Northern South America is very rainforesty and, and was at the time too. And so if, if you can survive in a really dry climate, such as the Southern United States and Mexico, if there's food there, you're going to be fine. So which means things like deer if they can live in a desert, there's lots and lots of plants for it to eat in a forest. Whereas, so it would be able to move south into South America just fine. Whereas the things in South America that are used to forest and adapted to forest had a much harder time moving north because there was not forest. I I think that makes sense. So it's more or less... If you can eat grass, you can eat leaves. But if you are adapted to eat leaves, you are probably not very good at eating grass. Okay. Yeah. Is, so this is a again, square rectangle thing. Yes. So and that's very broadly how it works. Um, that's, again, an oversimplification, but more or less. And that's why deer, like I said, we're going to circle back to deer because deer... Just the, the same genus that, you know, the white-tailed deer, mule deer, you know, the most common deer in North America. Um, the same genus got down to South America and then just exploded. Deer have their highest diversity in South America, and they've only been there for two and a half million years. Because deer are just real good at being able to eat literally anything. And they're really, really, okay. really efficient in their digestion because they're ruminants, sort of like cows are. They have the multi-chambered stomach to be right. able to get more nutrients out of their food relative to things without that really complex stomach that 
get comparatively less nutrients from the same food. So long story short, North American animals, because they were used to drier climates, once they got to the forests, which have more food, they were able to be like, okay, well, if I can deal with, you know, living in a desert, living in a forest, I should be just fine. But the things that are used to having a lot, a lot of food around them could not really cope with having less food in deserty type areas. That is more or less what kind of we think happened. Again, never just one thing. It is probably a con- right. like combination of there being better competition in North America and also, you know, the food thing. But it's like animals aren't going to migrate somewhere without there being food there. So there was just really no incentive for them to move north. Right. Exactly. So it would be you know, there was way more incentive for North to move South and figure out ways to adapt to live there than for South to move North. Exactly. Because they were going to die out anyways. Mm -hmm. Can I propose, and when I say propose, like you can tell me why this is probably wrong. Absolutely. But just like from, you know, thinking about this, you know, as, you know, as the history teacher that I am, you know, you know, swaths of, you know, I would I'd say organisms dying out, but I'm going to be talking about people here, so I hesitate to use that term. <laughs> um, but like, you know, we're talking about you know evolution on and existing on kind of separate, uh, you know, kind of separate tracks. You know, when Europeans first come over to the Americas, there is you know disease gets passed, and that wipes out far more of the uh, Native Americans that lived uh, on North in North and South America, then, you know, ever could have been killed by, you know, the brutality that existed otherwise. Is there any kind of disease that could be, uh, that's a factor here when we're talking about just strictly animals? Is that totally a human thing? What, what role could some sort of disease factor play? I wouldn't say that it's totally a human thing, but you know, humans are the same species. It is much, much easier to pass a disease from you to a, another member of your species right. than, than it is to, you know, it, it is much easier for me to pass a disease to you than it is for me to pass a disease to my dog. Okay. So, so couldn't necessarily rule it out, but, you know, probably not a main factor. Right. Probably not. And also there's literally no way for us to know that because it's not like diseases preserve very well in bones. Right. So, um, but then we get to sort of the aftermath of it. So lots and lots of North American things move South. Some South American things did move North. So some of the most notable examples are those big ground slots. We have evidence of them getting all the way up to like Alaska. Oh, wow. They did real well. They did great. Good Um, good for you, ground sloths. Good for you. Those big glyptodonts, the like car-sized armadillo things, they did very, very well in like the the southern United States. So they did great in all and also like, you know, northern Central America. So like Mexico, they did great. Texas. I think we have some fossils of them from Florida. Um, So they did great in sort of the southern part of North America. Mm -hmm. Um, But as for things that did super well that are not still around, that's pretty much it. Um, One of those weird notoungulates, one that's roughly rhino-sized, also got relatively far. I think we found them in like Wyoming. So they also got relatively far north. However, there are some that are still around such as things like armadillos, which I've mentioned, which are very common in Mexico and Southern United States. I've never seen an armadillo and I'd love to. They seem adorable. They're very cute. Um, Sloths, obviously, are very, very prolific in Central America. They're Mm kind of all over the place. Um, Let's see. We have, obviously, the opossum. That is the only marsupial to really make it north. Uh, that is, I mean, it's the only species of marsupial that we have in North America today. So, um, porcupines also porcupines originally came from, well, they came to South America from Africa, but then came to North America from South America, mm-hmm. which is neat. Um, yeah. and then a handful of other 
groups like uh, tree frogs came from South America. E- even, you know, the ones that live as far north as like New York, like all the tree frogs that I grew up with, they came all the way up from South America. But they're much, much less common than things like basically everything that lives in South America nowadays. Uh <laughs> About 50%, so half, of mammals that are not bats, because bats, for some reason, didn't really... Like, yes, we have bats in North America. They're not nearly as diverse as they are in South America. Um, But they're also weird because they they fly, which makes studying their, like, movement patterns throughout, you know, Earth history, you know, long-term history, really hard. Um, so 50% of non-flying mammals in South America today are descended from North American animals. Say that one more time. Half of the mammals living in South America today came from North America, or at least evolved from animals that moved south during the Great American Biotic Interchange. Okay, so that sounds just so completely wild. Just for context here, and I don't know if you have this number off the top of your head, do we know what the reverse of that is? What is the total percentage of mammals living in North America that are descended from South America? As a percentage, I would say like one. That's just well, because there's there's wild. one species of opossum. I think one species of porcupine, and then a handful of species of armadillo, and I'm pretty sure that's it. Wow. Yeah. And again, if we were to look at, you know even as as little as 20,000 to 30,000 years ago, that number would be higher because we still had those ground sloths and those glyptodonts. Those hung out, hung around for quite a while. Um, basically until people got here. Shocker. Um, <laughs> which is a topic for a, t- a completely other time. Um, right. But yeah. And it's like things, S- South America is so cool and, and so weird. And then, as per usual, people, came, people, animals came from the north and uh, killed all the diversity. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's not just a human thing, but it isn't not a human thing. It's just it's just a uh, an Earth thing. Yeah, but that is, in a very broad nutshell, the Great American Biotic Interchange. Great American Biotic Interchange. Um, and actually, I actually do have it in the blog post. There are three species, there three mammal species uh, in the temperate areas of North America. So that's not including uh, like southern Mexico where it's uh, in Central America where it's warm. Um, only three species made it into temperate areas of North America from South America. Wow. Just three. Yeah. Wow. That's. Oh, and then another quick antidote that I thought was fun that actually did make it in the blog post because I couldn't find a place to put it to be fun. Um, but the uh, mountain lion, it d- evolved in North America, moved south to South America, where, where it still currently lives, went extinct in North America, and then migrated back north from South America. Wow. Good, you know, good on the mountain lion for having some foresight. I know. I love mountain lions. Mountain lions are great. Do we know why they went extinct up in North America and then were able to come back? And I don't know. I don't. I don't know why that. Why that is. Wow. Like I know what you. We talked about our Pleistocene rewilding. You know, that, that also could ago, but that also could very well be a lack of good fossils. Cats also tend to not live in places that fossilize super well. Oh, okay. That's an interesting little wrinkle. Yeah, so, again, potentially, but from, from what I have read, that is true for mountain lions. Um, we have, like, a decent gap in their fossils in North America, but still continue to find them in South America. Right. But, yeah. Cool. So, is that, uh, I mean, I know that there's quite a bit more, and I want to know more, but as far if uh, if we're sticking with our nutshell here, is that all we have on the Great American uh, Biotic Interchange? Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much it. And obviously, like, there's a ton of other, like, weird aspects. Like, for example, some animals t- that today are sort of 
known from South America or like most people think of South America when they think of them, things like llamas, uh, things like tapers, both of those groups, I don't know if they evolved in North America, but got very, very diverse in North America, then moved to South America because they could, because competition was getting pretty stiff in North America, moved to South America uh, where competition was less stiff and then went extinct in North America. And we don't have them here anymore. <laughs> so yeah, things like um, llamas and alpacas, they, they're, they group. So they are in the tribe Lamini of uh, the camel family. That subfamily did evolve or that tribe did evolve in North America. Mm -hmm. And then we just, obviously we don't have camels native to North America anymore. Which is a damn shame. I know. And we've, we've also talked about this. Right. The American Camel Corps. I feel, (laughs) I can't wait till I teach U.S. history again so I can incorporate that into my lessons. And you absolutely should, even if it's not related. Just the fact that we use military, military grade camels. Do you know how much time I spend in class, like things that aren't going to be on the test at the end of the year? I'm like, this is awful. <laughs> we're learning about this stuff be- because it's not on the test at the end of the year, because it's yep. way too cool for the test at the end of the year. Uh, well, if, uh, <laughs> geez, I believe that is all, uh, all we have on, uh, for this. And this is going to be, I, if I had to bet, uh, assuming that we are doing this podcast, for a while longer, we are going to be revisiting a number of topics that we talked about in this episode, because Mm -hmm. I feel like we could, uh, we could branch off a number of different times with what we talked about here. Absolutely. And it's like, I I would like to start doing, um, you know, whole episodes about just like a specific group of animals instead of, you know, just various events or or things. Um, Obviously I'm not an expert on every group. I would consider myself an expert in, probably one group of horses. Yes. Um, And, but I I would like to learn more about all these other groups. So if you have a particular group of animals that you would want to hear us talk about, please fill out one of those forms that will be in the show notes. Absolutely. And with that, I think that is going to end this episode. This has been episode 16 of, I wish you were dead a podcast about things that used to be alive. Gavin, I've been listening to some other podcasts and sometimes they just end episodes with saying, this is the end. Okay, this is the end.